Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mrs. Spanis Clemens? Here. Mrs. Cullen? Here. Mrs. Dolan? Ms. Kilberry? Mr. Krause? Here. Mr. Rice? Here. Ms. Thompson? Here. Mrs. Walters? Here. Dr. Yarnell? Here. Public comment. According to policy 903, we remind everyone of the following. Public comment shall be limited to three minutes unless otherwise specified by the board. Participants must, re must be recognized by the presiding officer and note their name and municipality. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer rather than individual board members, district employees, or members of the public. A speaker may speak once during each comment period. Please note that these sessions are designated for comments to protect the confidentiality and privacy rights of all members of our community. The board encourages members of the public to direct any comments regarding particular individuals, such as students or district employees, privately to the superintendent or other appropriate administrators or board members, or to communicate with the board and superintendent privately by sending an email to psdschoolboard at penridge.org. Questions raised and not addressed may be followed up at a later time. Madam President. Uh, I would just note that we have uh, six or seven speakers, um, which is uh, a, a good amount of public participation for us. Um, and so I would remind the speakers that, uh, as Ms. Pans Clemens indicated, uh, in, under policy 903, we have three minutes um, to make sure that we're fair to everyone. Um, it's three minutes, and then uh, that three minutes can last a couple more seconds, and then we ask everyone to sum up and move on and again that that rule is equally applied there is another comment period at the end of the meeting as well so um, everyone will have a chance to have their say so thank you thank you okay first we have kylie watson <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Kylie Watson, and I'm a senior writer for the school newspaper, The Pendulum. And I am writing an article about the rumors concerning the topic of bringing armed security into the district. Um, I would just like to ask a few questions to confirm or deny the rumors that are spreading around the community. Um, I have a list of four questions. Would you prefer that I list them and they be discussed during the meeting or address them one by one? So Kylie, this is public comment time, so why don't you go ahead and read them all. Okay. We then obviously, maybe during the course of discussion, we might be answering some of them. Okay. And if, if at any point we don't get them answered this evening, I'll follow up with you tomorrow to make sure that we answer any of them that aren't addressed tonight. Okay, okay. thank you. You're okay. Welcome. So just more questions um, to begin with. Um, my first question is, will our current security officers become school police officers? And if not, uh, will they remain in their current positions? My second question, why are we replacing two security guards versus adding two to the current staff? My third question, why not just arm our current security officers versus bringing in two new armed security officers? And finally, does Penridge School District have a high crime rate that justifies AB for police officers or um, armed security guards? Thank you. Christian Evers. Right, 
that's on. Okay. Um, uh, my comments are also about the uh, armed guards and schools. Um, uh, first, I'd like to uh, ask you to justify the need for armed guards in our schools. Uh, has there been an increase of uh, incidents that require armed guards? Have we had a need for deadly force, which is concerning? Uh, please give us the data regarding these threats that might help us understand uh, the path that we're taking. Uh, if approved, who would these armed guards be? Uh, what would be their qualifications? Uh, would they have the same duties as regular police officers in our community? Would they have an education background to help, us, uh, help them understand the students they may be guarding? And finally, would they be looking out or would they be looking in, which uh, concerns me. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to comment on the cost of the measure. Uh, I worry that if we place an armed guard, it sounds like in the high school only, uh, parents will request armed guards in all the schools. Uh, and uh, since the district has seven elementary schools, three middle schools, one high school, the Upper Bucks Technical School, I figured there would be a need for 17 armed guards total. Uh, I, I figured this by one in each elementary school, two in the remaining school, or in each of the remaining schools because of the several floors. Uh, it could cost well over a million dollars annually. Uh, I don't know where this money will come from. I understand the safety of our children may not have a price tag, but it does. It will cost. Uh, these funds, will these funds come from increased taxes, cuts in education, or an end to athletic programs and arts programs? Uh, I'd like to answer these questions somehow throughout the uh, meeting. Part of the uh, Penridge Aquatic Club, we actually run our uh, swim meets out of the uh, pool area that you, that you provide for us and we pay for. Um, past two years, two years ago, the doors were open and our parents got in and out. This year, there was a different policy, which my wife didn't agree with, but I agree with, <laughs> uh, where you actually had a parent sitting at the door allowing the parents and kids coming in. I do believe in hard things in school. I do think there's a certain level of security we need to take. Uh, I've been here for since 2007 when the school was built. I haven't heard of anything crazy happening. Um, we implemented these different uh, procedures. Why are we going from, we add, added more security guards, which I welcome. Um, I did a great job in that. But why are we moving from these measures now to an armed security guard? Is there a, a warranted need for it? And you have to bear with me. I grew up in Brooklyn, and I grew up, went to school in Boston. So I've seen different things. I moved to this area for a different reason, and I don't, didn't want to have armed security guards for my kids. So. But I just want to hear your reason. That's all. Thank you. My name is Jatana Wasserman and I'm from Bedminster Township. I have one child in the high school and one at North Middle School. Both will be at the high school next year. My family and I used to live in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and I followed the gun violence epidemic since the a little over six years ago in December of 2012. In my work in gun violence prevention, I have met many survivors from all over, including Sandy Hook, Columbine, Virginia Tech, the AME Church in Charleston. Fred Guttenberg, father of 14-year-old Jamie, who was killed last year in Parkland, Florida, and parents of many killed in the streets of Philadelphia. 
I recognize the difficult position in which this board and administration finds itself. These are difficult times and you must all be struggling to make sure the right decision for, for all of our children. I hope the decision that you make are evidence-based and you want, to, you want to make sure our schools are safe as they can be without causing any harm. I believe having armed guards on campus will not prevent a school shooting and it has a great risk of causing harm. There was an armed guard at Columbine and an armed guard at Brooklyn. Our high school is huge. It takes 10 minutes to get from one end to the other. The tragedy at Sandy Hook took five minutes and the tragedy at Parkland took only seven. What are the chances of our security officer being in exactly the right place at the right time when something terrible happens? If something happens. Having our security personnel carry loaded, unsecured weapons in a school full of children causes many risks. It introduces significant risk of increased anxiety, especially within our minority population. Risk of overreaction or inappropriate intervention by a safety resource officer with a loaded weapon. Risk of accidental discharge. Risk of an older student overpowering and taking the weapon away. And it also complicates law enforcement response. Having armed guards on site can cause more chaos in an emergency. Armed guards have been also victims caught in the crossfire, unintentionally shot in the heat of the moment. Just two weeks ago, a police officer in civilian clothes was shot by friendly fire during a robbery in Queens, New York. During the shooting last November at a bar and grill in Chicago, police entered a chaotic scene and shot the security officer dead. Any perceived benefit of having armed guards on campus is outweighed by the risks. So you, if you don't do this, what can you do? The resources that will be used for this would be more effectively used by hiring and training more counselors and staff to recognize students before tragedy happens. Recognize students at risk. Create a school community that supports students standing up and stopping incidents before they happen. Train faculty and students to be on the lookout for anyone at risk. And Ms. also... Wasserman, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, as I mentioned, that we have a three you want me to finish? Could you just, yes, could you please just sum up quickly? Sure. Thank you. The last thing that I would say is to also get over the stigma of of um, not wanting to talk about guns, guns. Last year we had a program here that was supported by Matt, um, Bucks County um, DA Matt Weintraub in Nova, um, teaching parents and the people in the community to lock up your guns. We teach people about opioids in our community and how to deal with them. We should, you know, do the same thing about guns. And the highest risk factor is an unsecured gun, and we've seen that in this community already. Thank you. I apologize, I, I went out of order. Uh, Jim O'Connor. I'm not there. <laughs> yeah, my name is Jim O'Connor, my son is a senior at Perks and Burl. Um, obviously, like everybody else, well, a lot of people hear about the discussion about armed security. My main concern is what example and again, I don't know what you guys are thinking, but what example uh, you're following. If we're following Quaker Town Borough, where they have a sworn LEO, or law enforcement officer, in the school who does additional SRO duties, has that training, that's one thing. I understand there's funding available for that. What I'm concerned about is some of this sounds a lot like we're going to put a security guard with a gun in a school. That's terrible. Terrible idea. A law enforcement officer, when they have to possibly shoot humans and be in situations where that might occur, they go through yearly updates with their department. They go through training, that's where they simulate shooting situations, simulate the stress and how to deal and when you can and cannot shoot backstops, things like that. They do this all the time to maintain just a bare ready state to be able to handle a situation like this. If you don't have a sworn law enforcement officer doing this, if the school's just literally going to hire somebody and give them a gun, uh, maybe Act 44 has allowed them to do that now, since Governor Wolf signed that in, but who's going to pay for the training? Who's going to 
make sure that they're up to date as an office, a law enforcement officer would be. Somebody who might have to kill a human. This is a big deal. If it, <clears throat> excuse me, and a little bit of concerning right now is I don't see anybody from Pendridge Regional Police Department here, unless I'm mistaken. Um, if we're talking about arming people and putting them in the school in their jurisdiction, I think their input might be wisely sought. That's really about it. I can't see how more guns is the answer, but I hope we're thinking about all these things, the liability that we're going to take on by giving guns to security guards who aren't going to have, I assume, the training that a law enforcement officer would. That's false. Nor the screening, nor the background checks, nor the evaluations every year to make sure they're still fit to do so. It's a bad, bad road. I understand why you're going and talking no, about it because of the climate. We're going down a real bad path here that I can't see how it doesn't lead to the road. Uh, just, if you can answer questions about who it's going to be, but just please think about this. If we've got a crime problem in here that I don't know about, great. If you're really looking to be anti-mass shooting incident, this is not, this is not the way it works. tonight. Uh, these questions have been brought up many times years ago, as much as eight years, as far, far back as probably eight or nine years ago. So uh, I'm speaking from a little, I'm speaking because I have kids in the school and I'm concerned with their safety. I spent some time on the board and I know it's, it's going to be a difficult decision. But in the, in the past years, uh, the district has hardened our facilities. There weren't always vestibules in every school like you see now. They came one at a time. So we've done that, or boards have done that over the years. We've implemented an uh, entry system, Raptor system, which went through massive amount of discussion. How it's going to ruin everything, slow everybody down. We had con uh, security consultants come in time and time again. Uh, the gentleman before me wondered where Penridge community was. But the, I was wondering where you were, to be honest, no offense. So they've been here numerous times. Uh, we introduced Alice training to our staff here over the years. Another lady stood up, had all the, all the gun, uh, school violence statistics. I don't, I didn't check, I, I really didn't come that prepared tonight. It was kind of a spur of the moment thing. So we've had a gradual uh, progression of taking care of, of all we could to deter us from being on the map. Uh, and I think we've done a good job of that. Now we're at, uh, some new things have occurred where in the past few years, Penridge has gotten themselves on the national scene by, uh, you know, almost painting a target on ourselves when I used to sit up there because suddenly we're in the national news for student protests. Suddenly we're in the national news for uh, bathroom signs. So to me, we're like inviting people to say, oh, now, now they know who we are. Countless lawsuits that you'll never know about. There's things you talk about in an executive session. I wish I could say them here, but I can't. So if you're one, and some of the questions you're asking of this board, these are basic things that I can guarantee have, gone, have been gone over countless times. So I'm here to support whatever decision you make. I know these board members, there's probably 40 different board members, three different superintendents involved with arriving at this time, at this date. Are we gonna go through with this, okay? So I'm going to rely on the time already that, we, that was put in by everybody uh, and that knowledge. And we're not the first ones. We should have, we could have been. And finally, I know I'm running out of time. This security, uh, armed security guard discussion has been lingering for three years, just this part of it, where we were going to do it. Then we pulled out. What are we going to do? Are we going to have our own police department? Are we going to tap into, to, uh, uh, regional police. They'll come up with a decision, okay? Mr. Casper, I'll just ask you to, to 
to sum up, if you don't mind. Please. Thank you for your time. I think you know where I'm coming from, and do a good job. We're counting on you. Thank you, sir.
and you shouldn't be. You need to really give this thought. You have to look at studies. You have to talk to your faculty. You have to talk to your students. And you have to make a, a better effort to talk to parents to see how they feel. Thank you. Full disclosure, I have no students in the high school, but I read the news like everybody else, and I care about the sanctity of human life. The day before Columbine happened, nobody thought it would ever happen there. The day before the shooting at Parkland, nobody thought it would ever happen there. If you don't in every, almost every case that I have heard of, the only thing that has stopped the shooters is a bullet. You have to take them down. You can't wave your arms. It, principals jump in front of students to save the students' lives, and the principal gets killed, and maybe also the student. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And I know that's not popular with this crowd, but in almost every case, you might say, well, there was an armed guard there, and there were still killings. Well, maybe there were five killings instead of 15. Do you want to look somebody in the eye and say, your child was number 10 that got killed, and he would have been saved had there been an armed person on site, but we had to wait for the local law enforcement to arrive and get into the building and find out where to go, where is the cafeteria. That armed guard in this building is going to know where that cafeteria is. He's going to hear those shots. He's going to know the building. He will know how to get there, and he will be there minutes ahead of anybody that's driving from the Penridge Area Police Department. I have heard of many more shootings than where a student uh, overtook an armed guard at the school. I know that the shooting up in, um, I forget the name of the town where the little grade schoolers got shot, that was not a student. And uh, there's many shootings where you can have all the counselors for your current students that you want, but the shooter is from the outside. He may have already graduated. It may just be somebody that lives in the community. So adequate counseling is great, but it's not a guarantee. And I don't want to look the parent of that 12th child that got shot because we were waiting for the local law enforcement to come rather than having somebody right here who knows the building and can get there in two or three minutes instead of 10. No applause? No. Too bad. Any other comments? You have to wait till the end. Oh, the end of the meeting was yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Leanna Goodrich. I'm a teacher at Penridge High School. I have to thank, I've been here since 2003, which was when I started here. So I taught back in the days of the lower house, where it was quite intimidating because kids passed between the three buildings. So anybody could enter the building at any time, and we did lockdowns, and the doors didn't lock. So we would do the lockdown drills, and everybody would hide, and we knew that if anybody was coming in, all they had to do was open the door. We have made such progress here at the high school. And I thank you for providing us the security, the additional cameras. I have a principal certification, so I spent three years working with our principals on disciplinary issues. I can tell you, I feel very safe in the school. Um, I've taught in inner city schools. I didn't feel safe there. I wanted to add one additional aspect I want you to please consider. I've been teaching for over 20 years. Student anxiety is out of control these days. Kids struggle with grit. 
they struggle with popularity social media. I truly believe bringing guns into schools is going to compound that problem versus making things better. Anybody who knows me knows that I would lay down my life for my students. My sister says to me all the time, that's your biggest stress about me being a teacher, is that I could potentially be called upon to do that. I want you to think about our kids and their stress level. Because seeing somebody walking through the building with a gun in their hip, I don't believe it would make things better. I think, feel we are reacting. We've done some great things in the past. But please be careful that we consider the higher anxiety levels that we could cause for our students that would get in the way of their educational advancement. Thank you. from a discussion standpoint is on the agenda. Um, so we're going to wait till we get to that agenda item to have that discussion since it comes out of committee. So it won't, it's only take five or six minutes for us to get there, but I just wanted people to know that um, since it's a discussion item and not a voting item. So we will get there when it gets to the agenda, so we'll be there quickly and then talk through uh, some of the items. Thank you. so I don't uh, take a lot of time because it's a complicated uh, topic. But the Upper Bucks County Technical School uh, Joint Operating Committee unanimously passed the proposed budget for the 2019-2020 school year that ends the gentlemen's agreements that have significantly underfunded the Upper Bucks County Technical School for over a decade, refunds the overpayments that resulted from the second gentleman's agreement two years ago, and begins to fully fund the Upper Bucks County Technical School in compliance with the Articles of Agreement. The Joint Operating Committee members, along with the superintendents and business administrators from all three sending schools, work together with the administration from the Upper Bucks County Technical School to accomplish these goals. Back in 2006, a gentleman's agreement was put in place that would artificially cap district increases and pool substantial funds from fund balance, creating a structural deficit. The caps were proportional, so sending districts were underfunding it equally. In 2018, a second gentleman's agreement was put into place by the JOC, requiring the district whose payment would decrease to give up that decrease and make the same higher payment it had the year before. This resulted in Penridge disproportionately making an overpayment of $136,442 $136, and Palisades making an overpayment of $24,718. The Penridge School Board voted down the budget. The Upper Bucks County Technical School budget only needs a majority of two districts to approve it, but to change the funding formula being used, the majority of all three districts would have needed to approve it. This current budget that we have, uh, that was just passed, um, the, it was the proposed budget was passed um, over at the JOC. Um, this budget refunds those overpayments, so it credits us back the $136,000 overpayment, um, and also credits back Palisades, and follows the funding formula as written in the Articles of Agreement. It also bases the budget on actual spending as well as fund balance actually utilized last year. So it puts us uh, in a better position to fund our, our, our tech schools um, across the board. And uh, I'd just like to say that you know the, all three districts worked really hard on this and I appreciate all the hard work of our uh, JOC board members, our, uh, the business administrators from all three districts and the superintendents and uh, you know the, the leadership of Dr. Harner, who is uh, um, you know the super, superintendent of record over there. So, thank you. And next up is the superintendent's report. I'm going to focus on 11 items because Penridge is awesome. <laughs> uh, I just want to share some good news <laughs> items over the last month since the last time we've met. First, I want to tell you about our Governor STEM team project. The governor started a new proposal where he had asked STEM teams, he gave them $500 to 
to generate an idea and that the purpose was to say, how can you improve Pennsylvania through STEM? The only requirement was you couldn't spend more than $500 and the project had to be able to be expanded easily to a larger scale because some of these projects they hope will actually get funded and will expand to a larger scale by the state if they are. So the Penridge High School team, consisting of Sophia Goodson, Anna Dant, Morgan Leo, Brady Schneider, and Connie Cohen, competed this past Friday at the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. Our team, named the Nerd Squad, and under the direction of Ms. Melissa O'Brien, a biology teacher, received the highest presentation score out of all the teams that presented that day, and will be presenting, will be representing Bucks County at the state competition at, on May 9th and 10th. Dr. Scheid and I were able to see a run through of their presentation on Thursday afternoon, and it was simply amazing. They designed and produced a functional prosthetic finger that was printed using solely a 3D printer and recycled plastics. We're so proud of the team and the way they represented Penridge. One of the things that the judges commented on was the fact that they had strong partnerships within the community. Mr. Dale Tennant, who owns Tennant Manufacturing in, in Telford, actually lost a finger recently in one of his machines at his office, and they designed the finger for him. He attended the competition with the students. <coughs> he also has been giving the students tips and tricks on how to mass produce the prosthetic, since this is part of the rubric for the next step of the STEM competition. The judges were quite impressed because they had never had a partnering community member attend a presentation before. The students did an excellent job working as a team, and they certainly made Cambridge proud. So congratulations to the Governor's STEM team. I had the pleasure recently spending some time in Dibler Elementary School's brand new Fab Lab. It is a wonderful facility, and I want to thank Principal Casey Plord and teachers Tracy Myers and Amy Weir for making this happen. I also want to thank PPL Corporation and the Penridge Education Community Education Foundation providing the funds for the STEM lab. This is a fab lab where the teachers can take the students to expand their curriculum. Um, it has places like a maker space. It has places uh, for the students to work on other materials. And we're currently evaluating what that could possibly look like in our other <coughs> elementary schools as the teachers and dialers are utilizing that. I want to congratulate students from the Technology Student Association. We have 12 students from the high school who will be competing in six different categories at the state conference in April. They earn their spots during Region 5 competition in Quakertown on February 9th, and you can see a complete list of their names on our website. We'll be inviting the students back, but when students are going to state competition, we wait till the state competitions are over, and then invite the students to come to recognize them in person. But since it just happened, I wanted to mention it so that we can be following along with them. Over this month, the high school recognized 52 different students in all four grades at the second semester RAMS breakfast. RAMS is an acronym for Recognizing Achievements and Meaningful Successes. They do a, a breakfast four times a year at the end of each marketing period. The idea for a RAMS breakfast was created just a year and a half ago when the administrative team was discussing additional ways to recognize students for their successes in schools. Each of the departments at the high school awards one student from each grade level for their academic achievements and their embodiment of the Takes Pride theme. Last Friday, our high school debate team completed the regular season at Salisbury High School going 8-0 and, and posting 25 perfect scores by 12 different students, which sounds really hard. Yes. The team finished the regular season with a 26-6 record, and they're going to be seated second in the Lehigh Valley Interscholastic Debate Association. The Penridge High School debate team has 36 members and is coached by the high school librarian, Ms. Lisa Maderick. The team will continue into the postseason, and that will begin in March. Congratulations to our high school drumline on its first place finish at the North Penn Percussion Competition this past weekend. Congratulations to senior Maddie Rhine for winning the Pennsylvania Association of Family and Consumer Sciences Incoming Freshman Scholarship. She received the award to recognize her active leadership while maintaining a strong academic record and participating in additional school activities. After reviewing more than a dozen worthy candidates, the Penridge Community Education Foundation has announced its 2019 Friend of Education Award winners. Technology Education Dinner, Alan Androkaitis, Penn Central Librarian, Mary Lou Ashworth, and bus driver and author, Marie Hall. They will be honored on Tuesday, April 30th, at a lovely evening at the Sellersville Theater. You can reserve your tickets on the PCEF website. Um, some wonderful uh, alumni news. Miss Alexis Herring, who graduated this past year, class of 2018, 
was a member or is a member of the United, uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst synchronized figure skating team that recently earned a spot in U.S. national set for next month. The team qualified for the Eastern Regional event held uh, by uh, competing at the event held in Worcester, Massachusetts uh, at the beginning of February. We wish Alexa best of luck at the upcoming U.S. Nationals. Congratulations to our middle school wrestlers on their first place team finish in the Southeastern Pennsylvania Division I Championship Tournament. Our wrestlers competed against 34 other teams over two days and earned the top spot. Ryan Gallagher, who's an eighth grader from Penn North, won the Outstanding Wrestler Award for having the most pins in the least amount of time. Individual medals were also won by, which means the following students also placed in their uh, weight class. Cole Coffin, Ryan Gallagher, Sam Coons, Roberta Pavlik, Robert Pavlik, I apologize, Riley Cullen, congratulations mom, uh, Xavier Dantzler, Frankie Finelli, Laughlin Smith, Gio Iadonisi, and Tyler Wetzel. Our boys basketball team has advanced to the district semifinals for the first time in school history and will take on Abington tomorrow at Temple University. Regardless of the outcome of tomorrow's event and game, the team has clinched a spot in the state tournament. Also, a huge congratulations to senior Sean Yoder, who recently at the last game became the, became the team's and the school's all-time leading scorer. Also, a congratulations to our girls basketball team, who had its best season since 2007 and came one game shy of qualifying for the state tournament. In wrestling, junior Logan Green recently won the District 1 3A East title at 195 pounds with a pin in 46 seconds over Quakertown's Max Russell. It's just fun to say he beat somebody from Quakertown. All right. Indoor track. Sorry, Dr. Martin. Congratulations to the boys' relay team of Bobby Brashear, Anderson Diamond, Luke Eisler, and Matt Eisler, and Coach Bob Hosier on winning the gold medal in both the 4x400 and the 4x800 at the state indoor track and field championship this past weekend. In addition, Anderson Diamond also won second place individually in the 400 meters. In swimming, sophomore Joseph Hong took first place in the 100 breaststroke, uh, breaststroke and, two, and second place in the 200 IM at the Suburban One League Continental Conference Championships. In bowling, Zach Valentine and Casey Mannion both earned spots in the regional tournament. Uh, I now would like to hand this off to Dr. Scheid, who would like to speak about an opportunity she had with Manufacturing Day in a STEM contest. Dr. Scheid? Oh, let me pull this over here. Thank you, Dr. Bolton. I'm very excited to share this news. So back in October, I spent uh, Manufacturing Day up with our students, the Upper Bucks Technical School. And while I was there, the Operations Manager for the Bucks County Development Board asked if the Penridge School District would be interested in entering eighth grade students in a contest called What's So Cool About Manufacturing? And of course I said, I think we'd be happy to do that. So it is sponsored by the Delaware Valley Industrial Resource Center and the contest requires votes for each team and the teams with the highest number of votes in specific categories receive a winning prize at a special culminating event. All three of our middle schools have a team of eighth grade students participating in the contest. Students volunteered to join the team after seeing a short clip about the program in their eighth grade STEM class. <coughs> students created their team names and as part of their classroom studies, designed a team logo in the application that they use in their STEM class called Corel Draw. All teams were given a free GoPro camera along with additional accessories and were assigned local companies to visit. Led by one of our technology um, integrators, Aaron Reichert, and their STEM teachers, students at South Middle School, Team Jemba, which is an acronym for their name, traveled to Highline Off-Road, which is part of Daria Metal Fabricators in Percocy. Central Middle School, Team Name, Out of the Box Productions, traveled to Seacant Group in Quakertown and learned all about biomaterials that facilitate the repair, recovery, and regeneration in the human body. And finally, in early January, North Mission Impossible team from our North Middle School traveled to Penn Engineering to learn about the fastening industry and new product development technology. Each team has been working closely with educational media producers of PBS. This gentleman's name is Matt Lewis. 
He is editing and helping to revise their videos in hopes of winning in a variety of categories. We are competing against 27 other teams in the area, so we're asking you to view the videos. They're not finished yet, but view the videos and vote for our Penridge students. The dates for voting are Wednesday, March 20th until Friday, March 22nd. The, the, um, uh, there is going to be an upcoming PDS news article, and it, it's featured on the Penridge website. And there's details about the voting. And it's a really cool icon. It says what's so cool about manufacturing. And when our students are finished the videos, you'll be able to vote for those. And if you're familiar with American Idol, you can vote and vote and vote <laughs> as many times as you would like to. So we are encouraging you to do that. And we will be mess messaging this again and again. But we're really proud of the students. And I actually got to see an almost finished product at South uh, middle school today. And it's really a lot of work for our students. It's a fantastic opportunity. They were able to go out to these um, local manufacturing businesses here. But they took a lot of footage. So they have like 15 minutes of footage and they have to shrink that down to two minutes. And it's really a lot of work and it's very exciting and we hope that we um, get the support of everybody in Penridge School District for the contest. So thank you, Dr. <coughs> Thank you for working with the team, Dr. Shai. And as equally as exciting as the STEM contest, I have asked Mr. Daubert to provide an overview of the budget developed and its timeline <laughs> process, uh, just so that we can be aware since there are certain things coming up. So, Mr. Daubert, go ahead. I apologize. <laughs> uh, talking about the um, budget development for the 2019-2020 uh, budget, um, budget development started back in September. Uh, when the business office developed the budget calendar for the year and uh, submitted that calendar to the board, the finance committee that month. And then on October, uh, October 22nd, uh, the school board passed a resolution uh, to not increase taxes for the next year above what the Act 1 index, which is 2.3%. So basically, this allowed the board to uh, bypass the requirements for the Act 1 preliminary budget which would have been due in January <clears throat> by um, passing the resolution to not raise taxes above the index. And I say that if needed, okay? I'm not saying there's a tax increase, I'm saying if needed, the board would not uh, be able to raise taxes more than 2.3%. Then in early November, uh, cabinet members, principals, supervisors, and department heads all received budget calendar and budget development instructions um, and entry guidelines to enter that information into our accounting system. And in November and December, all principals and department heads met with their staff and their buildings to develop their budgets for the 1920 fiscal year. At the December finance meeting, we held a budget kickoff and outlook presentation where we went over some historical data with the board um, and, and gave some facts and figures looking forward to the new year. Then on January 7th, the deadline came for all preliminary budgets by all departments to be entered into the accounting system. And at that point in time, the business office takes over, um, begins their work on the in budget process. In January, we also begin to develop the revenue budget for the next fiscal year. We begin this by utilizing a combination of historical collecting, collection of data and future projections. We will look at the certified assessed value utilized by, for the county and the township real estate tax bills. We use this to estimate the assessed value for the upcoming school real estate bills. The review and estimation of the revenue numbers will continue from now on through June when we finish the budget process. In February, a list of requested new positions is developed based on academic scheduling needs, curriculum program implementation, assess student safety and security needs and student to staff ratio requirement. At the same time, the HR department, human resources department develops the personnel budget uh, by utilizing the, the cost for the current staff that are employed by the district for their salary and benefits. At that point in time, we develop a spreadsheet for every budget which is implemented by the department heads and principals 
and then we use those spreadsheets to compare three years of data, current year budget, and requested budget. At that time, the superintendent, business administrator, and director of finance meet with each cabinet member, principal, supervisor, or department head to review their preliminary budget. These 22 meetings are used to review 33 budgets, and they start the third week of January and run through the second week of February. Last year, during this process, we eliminated $455,000 in expenditures uh, just through this process. Also, in early February, the governor of the state makes his budget address to the legislature. And from that address, we receive estimated uh, revenue data from the state regarding our basic education funding, our special education funding, our transportation funding, uh, and other smaller, smaller line items. At the March, March 12th finance meeting, we'll take a we will take a first look at the general fund budget um, and at the same time, the transportation and operation departments will present their budgets to, to the board for the next year. The teacher's contract states that as of March 1st, the teachers who are, who are thinking about retiring must submit their information to the district um, with their intent to retire. And this information allows us um, a, a great deal of, of help in determining What's, what the staff needs are, what the cost of the staff are, and so forth. Then at the April 9th finance meeting, we'll have another budget update for the board, and at that point in time, the people's services and the technology departments will present their budgets for next year to the board. At the May 7th finance meeting, again, we'll look, we'll look at an update of the general fund budget, and at, the, at that point in time, the curriculum and program improvement budgets will also be presented to the board. We'll schedule additional budget meetings throughout the uh, spring if, if needed. But at the May 13th voting meeting, that is when the first vote on the 1920 budget will occur by the board. Then at the June 11th finance meeting, any additional budget changes will be made at that point in time. And then at the June 7th voting meeting is, is when the board will pass, or the vote to pass the final budget for the 1920 school. So that is a lot of information in a short period of time, but um, that's a uh, it's kind of the calendar that we we go. So. Can the board members vote as many times as they want for the budget, or can they only? <laughs> All right, never mind. Only if it's yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my final item has to do with Rachel's challenge. It's been a full time. Great, thanks. Uh, we're really looking forward to the presentations on March 12th and 13th. Just a reminder that all students in grades 6 through 12, uh, all our middle school and high school students, will see an age-appropriate presentation. High school students will see something that's called Rachel's Challenge, <coughs> while our middle school students will see Rachel's Story. Both presentations have an equally important message, but the middle school version excludes some of the 911 calls and some of the television footage that is a little more intense that is included in the high school and evening presentations. And although it is a very serious topic, none of the presentations include blood, dead bodies, or the shooting of weapons. We will be sending more information out to our families in the community this week to make sure they're uh, aware of the differences. We've gotten some questions about the appropriateness of this topic for middle school students, so I wanted to make it clear that there are different levels of presentations that are done. The evening presentation is identical to the high school presentation, so the, the community presentation does would not be a place for small children um, from that standpoint. On both of the afternoons of the 12th and the 13th, teams of students and staff from each of the four secondary schools will receive formal training on how to keep the momentum going that will be realized from the assemblies and continue them in their schools moving forward. These teams will work to determine how best to incorporate the message back at their buildings and in upcoming years. I look forward to seeing their work and updating the community on the impact it will have on our students and community. I would invite each one of you and everyone listening to please plan on attending and invite every one of your friends to the evening presentation on March 13th, beginning at 7 p.m. in the Penridge High School Auditorium. Mr. Darrell Scott, who is the father of Rachel, will be with us to tell her story and to encourage our community, as in Rachel's words, to start a chain reaction of kindness and compassion. The flyer that you see overhead is available in the table in the back 
or you can see me for more afterwards, as well as information is on our website, Facebook, and Twitter. So I would encourage each of you to attend um, and to tell all your friends about it. We're really excited for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I just I just want to add that it's a really, really powerful presentation. I really hope that all of you will come. It, it, you know, there were many, many kids and parents who um, approached Daryl after, you know, after his, his daughter's death and told them how much of an impact his daughter had on their lives and just the simple things that she did in her life, how she saved the lives of other people just with these simple things that she did and how um, she's continuing to save the lives of other people because she knew she was met, she knew that, um, you know, she was going to make a big difference in the world and so, you know, help her change the world with her story. Um, I also wanted to say about the Fab Lab, uh, we, were, we got to see kindergarten in the Fab Lab too on their 100th day of school doing all kinds of 100 day projects which was really cool too. So. Um, all right, and the student liaison report. Well, uh, representing on behalf of the uh, like students at uh, Penridge and student council, um, the past event we just had was uh, the winter ball dance at uh, the Penridge High School. It happened uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we had a huge, huge success and we had lots of um, attendance from each grade, which is good. Um, and in the future we will be having a uh, blood drive. volunteering at two events at the uh, Pearl S. Buck House, um, Tea Party, and also uh, Taste of the World. They will be happening in uh, April and May, so state of Penridge is good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Haley. I'm from the Upper Buck Technical School, and I'm here to tell you some things that happened over the past month. So in healthcare careers, majority of the seniors passed their certified intensity tests. In landscaping and construction, um, there's a created ter terrariumite. On February 27th from 6 to 8 p.m., space is only limited to 20 families and it costs $20 per family. Meals to go, Mrs. Ott, who's in charge of the CAF at the tech school, offers complete meals to go. It costs only $7 per single meal. And orders are due by March 15th and pickup is on Thursday, March 21st, between 1 to 3.30 p.m. Um, St. Patty's Day dinner, it costs $12 per meal. Missa also offers meals for St. Patty's Day. Um, offer orders are due on March 8th. It is on March 15th between 1 to 3.30. And if you want to like know what the meal set is, go visit our website. It's on the homepage. Um, breakfast with the Easter Bunny. You can eat breakfast with the Easter Bunny on Saturday, April 6th from 9 to 11 a.m. It's $8 for adults, 5 for children, ages from 3 to 9, and 3 for children to 2 and younger. It's also $5 to get a picture of the Easter Bunny. <laughs> I just want everyone to know that the items that Haley just spoke about, the Breakfast with the Easter Bunny, the Irish American menu, as well as some of their made-to-go meals, there are flyers along the front. So if you're interested in those events, I know they're also on the website, but if you want to pick them up on the way out, Mrs. Dolan wanted to make sure that I mentioned them. So thank you both. I just want to know, when do you have a date for the blood drive? Oh yes. Uh, that will be April 11th. Taxes. Okay. Next up is the consent calendar. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar items A through I. Questions or comments from board members? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Oh, sorry, 8-0. I didn't realize we had one more comment. And 
the committee reports. Activities, Mrs. Walters? Okay, um, the activities committee did not